All right, uh, so I think that you uh, have finished the background for applying f is equal to ma using a variety of coordinate systems and to solve a variety of problems. And I'm going to do two more of them for you today. Um, so I have a, uh, I have, I, I'm not quite sure what Professor Edmund has told you about problem solving, but I have a kind of a system that, uh, especially in the easy stages here, is three parts. And that goes structure, which is kind of looking at the, the physics of the problem and sorting it out, <coughs> and choosing the coordinate system. Okay, choosing the coordinate system. And then uh, the free body diagram is the left-hand side of Newton's second law. And then uh, the kinematics and putting it all together with the equations of motion is the third step. So uh, the thing about that strategy is that you never know when you're going to hit the tough part. You never know when you're going to hit the difficult part. And in fact, we hit the difficult part in two different places in the two problems that I'm going to do today. Uh, in the second problem, we hit the tough part in an unusual spot. All right, so let's have a look at this. Uh, this is a system of two masses, A and B, and they are connected through this pulley system. And we're given the masses, and we're given the information about the, uh, about the uh, uh, friction coefficients at this surface, and also at that surface. Obviously, that's an idealization at the ground. I'm not going to be able to demonstrate that idealization very well. And we're asked to find the maximum P such that B does not slip on A and the corresponding acceleration. So the structure in this one is really easy. Everything is happening in the X direction. It's essentially a scalar problem. And I will probably even slip up and uh, use scalar notation, maybe for acceleration when I should be uh, I should be expressing it as a vector. I, I may or may not forget to do that. Uh, but you can see that, uh, that choosing a coordinate system is nothing more than uh, choosing a positive direction on the x-axis. So the second step, <coughs> the second step is the free body diagram. Uh, no, 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 no. The rest of the first step is to have a good look. And so in the context of having a good look, I have a question for you. When P is applied and uh, this thing starts to accelerate, in which direction is B going to move? Is B going to move to the right or to the left? Okay, excuse me, I'm just fiddling with my little toy here. I can't get it. There we are. There we are. That's the wrong way. That's the right way. Is that the right way? Yeah. All right. Now, question. How many people think that B is going to move uh, to the left? And how many people think B is going to move to the right? Nobody? And how many people are so suspicious of my question that they're just afraid to answer it? Nobody. Nobody? No. All right, well, <clears throat> I've got a toy, and, uh, and it's, it's like this one, and it's very much an idealization, and in fact, I'm cheating about the friction, but it's okay. Uh, I'm not going to show you, at, at least initially, how I'm cheating on this. Nonetheless, the resulting motion is going to be in the correct direction, and so you're going to be able to see which direction B moves in. Like, it's going to be right in front of your face, like not even a video screen or anything. Yeah? Sorry, what do you mean step on? Like what is step on? Slip? Slip? No, you haven't no, slipped no, in the last week? No. Boy, I did. Boom, boom, right on the butt. Oh, geez, did I slip. Sorry? Does not slip on. What does that mean? It means, okay, that's, that's a very good question. And the answer to the question is going to give things away. If B doesn't slip on A, it means they're going to move together. Yes? Wait, so A can move. So A can't move? No, can move. A can move. Watch it move. 
Okay, we're going to watch it move. And we're going to watch the direction a bee moves in. Okay, oops, oh geez, I'm really having trouble with this little thread. Got to put it in here, in there, the glasses, you know, and the whole thing. There we are, I got it. All right, now we're going to watch it. In which direction did B move? Move to the right. No disputing that. All right, right, no disputing. All right, what's going on? We're going to sort it out. We're going to sort it out. Yes? You know what? Let's, <clears throat> let's finish the problem and sort it out and think about it, and then I'll come back to your question if you still ask it, okay? But I have phrased the question very carefully, and of course, not slipping on A is a significant part of the problem description, okay? All right. Uh, <clears throat> So, so, we've, uh, so we've had a good think, we've got our structure, and now uh, we're going to do a free body diagram. And the question with a problem like this, where there are two masses, is can I get away with one free body diagram of the system, or do I need two? And we can try with a little sketch <coughs> to treat the initial uh, uh, free body diagram just as a whole system. And so I can draw a free body diagram of the whole thing, and then B, and then the pulley, and you know, and that's a whole system, and the only external force on the system is P. Okay, but you see very quickly that that's not enough because we're asked for two unknowns, and this is only going to give us one equation. Okay, some of the forces in the x direction is equal to mAx. So that is not going to do it, but it does answer the first question. There is no way that anything is going to accelerate to the left when that is the free body diagram of the system. Okay? All right, <clears throat> so let's do two free body diagrams. And part of this problem is about reviewing doing two free body diagrams for a system of two particles. Okay? And I think you did this in statics, but I get enough questions in my own class that I, I think it's worth a good review. So let's start with mass B and look, forget everything else, look at the forces that are being exerted on mass B. Okay, so we isolate B. I'm sure you heard your Civ prof say exactly the same, same thing. We isolate B. What are the forces that are going to exert on B? Gravitational force. The normal force. I'm going to call that Fn1. All right, and what else? <clears throat> Let's put P on first, and then we'll put friction on. Okay. So P, quite clearly, is going to be the same tension all the way through that cable, and so it is operating on B to the left P. That is certainly exerting on B. And now I heard the last force over here, uh, friction. And so now my question is, in which direction does friction act? Does it operate to the left or to the right? It operates to the right. It operates to the right. There are lots of ways to see that, and maybe it's obvious, except just stop here. Just stop here. And and recognize that we have already seen that B is going to accelerate to the right. Is there any force so far that is going to accelerate this to the right? Nothing, right? So friction had better operate to the right. Because okay? there's nothing else that is going to accelerate the mass to the right. So in fact, the friction force does operate to the right. Now, just thinking about it, looking ahead, what's going to be the relative magnitude in the end, because you should anticipate your answers if you can, what is going to be the relative magnitude of those two x direction forces? We know it accelerates to the right. We saw it. There's no argument. Okay? So quite clearly, Quite clearly, friction is going to have to be bigger than P. Okay, okay 
Anyway, we'll get there. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so now that's one free body diagram. Is there any, is there any force I've forgotten about? No. Okay. No force. So now, the second free body diagram is not of mass A. The second free body diagram is of everything else. It's of everything else. So what we have done by putting this P here is we have essentially cut the system here and we have isolated mass B here. And so now we're going to draw our second free body diagram of everything else. So that includes mainly the bracket A, but it also includes uh, the pulley, and it includes that external force P, and it also includes that line up until the break, up until where I cut it. Now, is there, is there any, have I left out any part of the system? No. Now, let's look at the forces that are acting on the rest of the system, this second free body diagram. Well, I already put one on. What about here? Same deal. Same deal. Here's another P. This is the first of three examples of a principle of drawing two free body diagrams for a system of equal and opposite forces on the two parts of the system. So that P operates to the left where the cut is, and that P operates to the right where the cut is. They're equal and opposite on the two free body diagrams. All right, uh, so let's put on, uh, what should we put on next? Let's put on, let's put on another pair of, uh, another force that acts equal and opposite. Okay. So that is uh, acting up on the bottom of B. The same force is going to act down on the top of A. So that is Fn1. Uh, uh, yes, Fn1. And what else? All right, let's, uh, we'll do gravity after this, and, but we'll do friction now. And this is easy because, again, it's going to be equal and opposite. It, it operates to the right on B. It's going to operate to the left on A. So the friction force is there. And now someone said gravity, and that's correct. Gravity is acting through the center of mass of mass A. Does anyone want to put down MA plus MB? G. Good. Okay, good. We have isolated this part of the system. We are looking at the forces that exert on this system. Gravity sees 10 kilograms, and it's going to operate 10 times 9.81 through the center of mass of A. And what else? What else is exerting on A? The normal force. That is going to be Fn2. And that is the ground exerting on the bracket A. Any questions? Have I forgotten anything? Yes. I'm saying that if you If I, if I don't have f of n1, I've drawn an incorrect free body diagram. Oh, okay. All right? If I don't have fn1 on there, I have an incorrect free body diagram. I am looking at the forces that exert on the rest of the system. And that is a correct free body diagram. And you can see, checking with the other one, that it is a match. That I haven't forgotten. Well, I'm going to check the diagram to make sure I haven't forgotten. No, I haven't forgotten. All right, <clears throat> all right, so now that is the left-hand side of our equations, yes? So you mentioned um, inputting equal and opposite forces. What, why, why did you add MG to that? 
The short answer, the best answer is the one I've already given, in that you've got to isolate A, okay? You've got to isolate A and look at the forces that are acting on, sorry, the rest of the system. And Fn1 is, is there. Okay? Now, the, the, the other answer to your question, now I forget exactly the way you phrased the question. That is the effect of gravity of B, and we do not want to double count that. We do not want to double count that, all right? That's the effect. Fn1, the downward force, is the effect of gravity on B as it operates on A. Did I answer your question? <coughs> okay, I, it, I'll clarify it afterwards if, uh, if I didn't, all right? All right, those are the free body diagrams, and we can now apply F is equal to MA to each of them. And it's going to be in the x direction. And we're going to apply it first to my free body diagram of B. Okay, so there we have it. There we have it. And here is my advice about filling in information to F is equal to MA on the left hand side. It is a very anti intellectual uh, word that I'm going to use, very unsatisfying to the intellectually curious. Uh, my recommendation to you is you copy, you copy from your free body diagram. You have already done the work. You now look at the free body diagram and you copy. Okay? So the left hand side, the sum of the forces in the x direction on mass B, there is a minus P, there is a plus FF. I'm copying it. Minus P plus FF is equal to MB, the acceleration of B. And now I'm going to do the same thing for the second free body diagram. I am going to look in the x direction. I see that there is a minus FF. I see that there are two plus P's, and that is going to equal MA, the acceleration of A. All right, so now I've got two equations, and let's just count unknowns, see where we are. And we see that I don't know P, and I don't know FF. I know the mass. I don't know the acceleration. I don't know, I don't know. <coughs> I've got two equations and four unknowns. Four unknowns. All right, where am I going to get more information? Sorry? You heard that phrase? Did Professor Young use that phrase? Kinematically? Okay. Well, there is the kinematics, remember, are the motion. Kinematic variable is a motion variable. I've got two masses here. There is a relationship, a known relationship between the two accelerations. What's the relationship between the accelerations? They don't slip, they're going to move together, they're going to have the same acceleration. The fancy title is a kinematic length. When you had, did you do the pulling one where A was going up and B was going down? Okay. Well, the kinematic length there is that the acceleration of A is equal to minus the acceleration of B. I actually love that sound. All right, I'm still short one piece of information. Where am I going to get it? In the y direction? You know, it's not a bad thought. And we could go off in the y direction. And I'm not going to because I have a second problem to do because it's not going to get us anywhere. I 
remember telling you very clearly last Friday about maximum friction forces and that when the word maximum came up, I wanted you to be prepared to understand its significance. <laughs> I want the maximum P. How does that give me an extra piece of information? What kind of friction is it? It's static. It's the maximum P. If I go over the maximum P, B will slip. Okay. I can make the assumption. Well, I, I'm not making an assumption. I am using the information given to me to say, aha, uh -huh, in this circumstance, I've got the maximum static friction going on between A and B. And so that is equal to mu s f n, which f n I've got two there. F n one between a and b. So that turns out to be equal to 0.3 times. This is the only part where you need the vertical, and that's going to be f n one is going to be six g, six times 9.81. which is equal to uh, 17 point something. 17.7, yes. No, it's, it's, sorry, it's 0.81. I'm, I'm thinking of another problem. Okay, so let's just go back and have a look and see what's operating here. And indeed, we anticipated this, that we've got 17.7 .7 newtons pulling this forward and only 12.9 pulling it back. How does A move to the right? A moves to the right. It's got 17.7 .7 pulling it back, but it's got twice 12.9 pulling it forward. So everything tallies. Everything tallies. Now, have I, did I answer your question from five minutes ago? Yeah? OK. All right. I know that's a 1D problem and, and so on, but it's certainly worth some time. All right, I need some board. I'm going to erase it. I'll be right back. <clears throat>
Let's do one more. Uh, we've got a, a mass. It's uh, on a string. It's going around a fixed pole at a constant speed. And uh, we are asked to find the angle that the string makes, makes with the vertical and the tension in the string. Just notice, uh, I'm getting slightly better at this after teaching for many, many years, is recognizing when we're using multiple letters, because we do run out of letters, that's the mass, and those are meters. Okay, so no to, that's an easy one. All right, uh, so we've actually already had the demonstration for this last Friday. Okay, so this is what's happening. And I've got it going at a certain, at a certain speed. And you can see, you can see that the, that the angle, and you can't see the tension, but you can see that there is tension there. And you can see that once I determine the speed, once I determine the speed, both of those quantities are fixed, are determined. And that if I change the speed, then the laws of nature will alter the angle and alter the tension, increasing the speed. Okay, increasing the speed. So the reason that this simple problem with only one mass and only one string is actually going to give us two pieces of determined information of determined information is because F is going to equal MA in two different directions. Uh, all right, so <clears throat> the next thing I want to say about this problem is you've probably already done it. Uh, the reason I think that you've probably already done it is because I think most high schools do the race car on the banked track. Did you do that problem in high school? So this is what you did. You had a car on a banked track in high school, and that was the normal force that came into the problem, correct? This is my force that is coming into the problem. That's my force that's coming into the problem. So in essence, I think that you have done this. But the reason that I'm going to do this anyway is because remember my strategy is structure, free body diagram, equations of motion, kinematics and equations of motion. And the first step is structure, and that includes largely choosing the correct coordinate system. And one of the clues, if you don't know which coordinate system to use, your, the first thing that you want to look at is the path of the particle in question. So if you have a straight line path, uh, probably you're going to use rectangular. If you have a spiral path, you're probably going to use polar. Uh, if you have a projectile path, an arc, you're probably going to use rectangular. And in this particular case, you can see that the path of the mass is circular. And so it is very natural to use either polar or NT. And I'm going to use NT here. I'm going to use NT. So our natural inclination is to use the normal and tangential system based on the path. The problem is that nothing is happening in the tangential direction. It's going in the, at the same speed. It's not changing speed. There's no force in the tangential direction. We can write down on our, in our notebooks that the sum of the forces in the tangential direction is equal to MA in the tangential direction, but it's not going to give us anything. So in fact, what is odd about this particular problem is we're going to use a hybrid coordinate system. We're going to get information from the normal component of the NT system. And what's our other system? What's our, sorry, what's our other coordinate? I just said we are going to use N. What's the other one? You see, it's not, no, it's not going to be there. It's not going to be X and Y. It's going to be Y. It's going to be Y. Okay? It's going to be y, the Y direction. So in fact, uh, our coordinate system, the, our coordinates, our relevant coordinates, are going to be the N system 
and the Y system. That is unusual, and it's one of the reasons that I like to do this problem. All right, the other reason I like to do this problem, mathematically, this is two-dimensional. We're going to have two equations, we're going to have two unknowns, mathematically it's two-dimensional. And mostly this course is two-dimensional. But physically, this is a three-dimensional problem, right? You've got things operating in all three dimensions, okay? So the way that one can sometimes sort that out is to make, <clears throat> you've only got one mass, so you've only got one free body diagram, but I'm going to make the free body diagram from two views, two views. So first of all, we're going to have a side view, free body diagram, and then we're going to have a top view, free body diagram. And let's see what we can see in each of the views. All right, so here is my side view free body diagram. There is my mass. And there is my tension. Okay. And there's the angle theta. Now, I can see that. Now, that's not all I can see in this free body diagram. What else can I see? This is the y direction, so I can, I can fully see the y direction. We're not going to be able to see the y direction from the top view. Okay. The path is a circle. path is a circle. All right. What else can I see from the side view? It's not a force, okay? It's not a force. I've put the forces on its true. Okay. It's okay to put geometry and sometimes unit vectors on free body diagrams. Okay. And so I am just going to sketch in here that that is the normal direction. That's the normal direction. But the forces, the forces, I, it was clear. I know, don't think of anything else. And it's true, don't think of anything else until you get all the forces on and then you can think of something else. So that's the end. What direction can you not see in the side view of the free body diagram? <coughs> you can't see the T direction. The T direction is going in and out of the board as, as I've drawn the mass here on the left hand side of a circle. All right, let's look at the top view. <laughs> Okay, we knew that was the top view, right? So here's my mass, and this is a free body diagram. And so now we want the forces that we can see from the top view on the free body diagram. First of all, what can we not see from the top view? We can't see the y direction. We can't see the y direction, so we can't see mg. Sorry, what did you say? I said the same thing. Okay, all right, good. So we can't see MG. So we can't put MG on there because we can't see it. All right, but what can we see? It's because just whatever, like this, like UT Okay, we're going to decompose this into the vertical for our F equals MA in the Y direction. And we're going to take the normal, the, uh, 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 T sine theta is going to be in the normal direction, and that we can see from the top view. So this is going to be Fn, which is equal to T sine theta. Okay. Tricky. Tricky using these hybrid systems, using these plain views of a free body diagram. So even though this is still sort of a high school question, I think it's very much worth the effort to go through it. Sorry, yeah. uh, I just thought you can also see the, like the, the, the box, like, sports in the T direction, like in the speed of the... Yes, you could, yeah, except that there's no force in the T direction. So this is a free body diagram with forces on it, and there's no force in the T direction. Oh. And we know that because there's no acceleration in the T direction. 
Okay, v dot is equal to zero. Okay. All right, so now we have got everything we need. Uh, we can apply the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to mAy, which is what? which is zero, so this is, this is a SIV 100 equation, okay, that some of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero. We can see the y direction from here, and so I've got T cosine theta, T cosine theta, and the positive minus mg is equal to zero. And then the other equation is that the sum of the forces in the n direction is equal to m times a in the n direction. So I'm now going to look at the top view for my fn, and I have got that t sine theta the force force is going to the right there. Right? Force is going to the right. Are there any other forces? Did I forget any forces? Did I forget any forces? On that view? Why isn't that mass accelerating to the center? Thank you. It is. It is. Thank you. Good. Just checking. Just checking. T sine theta is equal to M times the acceleration in the normal direction. So you've got uh, different expressions for the acceleration in the normal direction. If I recall right, it's V theta dot, or R theta dot squared, or the one that you're most familiar with is V squared over R. That's the high school one. And since we know the magnitude of V, I'm going to use that one. They're all the same. V squared over R. So let's just, uh, okay, except what's R? R is the radius of the circle, because right? that's R. We don't know that. Yes, we do. Okay. It's L sine theta, L sine theta. All right, so uh, let's just, let's, uh, all right, I'll put this in here. So this is going to be M V squared over L sine theta. So let's just rearrange them slightly and put some numbers in. We have got T cosine theta is equal to, uh, M is 0.45 times 9.81. And we have got T sine theta squared, because that's going to come up. And that is going to be equal to 0.45 times V, which is 4, squared, divided by L, which is 1.8. Okay. So the story is that that's two equations and two unknowns. And uh, uh, if you're a math geek, you can go off down the analytical trail and try and solve those analytically. I think it takes a little bit of work, okay, but it's certainly possible. But <clears throat> I was a math geek in my youth, and I'm not anymore. So I call it trial and error, but one of my students says, it, it's, and I think it's a good description, it's called guess and check, guess and check. And in fact, that's a legitimate way to solve problems. It really is, especially in the days of cheap calculators and easy computers. Okay? You put in a T and a theta, and you calculate what those two quantities are, and you uh, alter your uh, suggestion until you arrive at the right answer. It should take, with a hand calculator, it should take about 90 seconds. And the answer is, oh, I better, better double check. The answer is uh, that T, <coughs>
Okay, I think uh, Professor Young is going to do uh, one more problem for you on, is it Monday or Tuesday in the next lecture? I warned him I was going to be a little early, but I'm not going to start the next one. It's a good one. And so uh, I'll see you on exam day, and uh, good luck. <laughs>